All right, we're going to go right into the next part of our program now. And we are excited to fill a uh, uh, screen for you, a short film entitled The Last Mile Inside San Quentin's Tech Incubator by uh, Andy Tamaner. Following the film, we're pleased to have a brief conversation between Natrina Gandana, program manager at The Last Mile Project, which is the first program in the United States to provide in-person our in-prison software engineering training. Um, also in the conversation will be Tulio Cardozo, technical manager for the Last Mile Project. Uh, he also worked as development lead for Launch Podium LLC and has successfully transitioned into a technology career as a formerly incarcerated person. So you will get to see something of his story told in the film. Please yeah, enjoy. So I, I have to collect myself too. I've watched this documentary maybe like I don't know, a dozen times, and I like tear up almost every time. Um, but good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Natrina Gandana. I am the program manager for The Last Smile, and I'm really excited that we're, we got to show you our documentary and tell you more about what we're doing. So in the documentary, you learned a lot about our story, you know, how we started off in 2010, teaching entrepreneurship in a small classroom twice a week, two, two hours each class. But since the documentary has aired, we've pivoted. In 2014, we added something new, something never before seen inside prison, and created the first ever computer coding program inside a US facility. Software engineering skills are in high demand, with an estimated one million unfulfilled jobs in an industry that judges not on the stigma of your past, but the quality of your code. Um, Many of our students have never touched a computer before, have never been on the internet, yet they are driven and dedicated to succeed. They spend eight hours a day, four days a week, for an entire year learning how to code, all without internet access. Starting in San Quentin, we are now across four California facilities with a new one opening up next month. Uh, two of which are women's prisons, so we're really excited about that. Yeah. We have a wait list of about 25 different states and countries eager to implement our program. For the first two years, Chris and Beverly taught these, these courses themselves twice a week. Now we have a staff of eight and over 100 volunteers. But we're always trying to do more, to push the boundaries of what is possible inside a prison environment. So recently, in partnership with CalPIA and CDCR, we launched a dev shop inside San Quentin State Prison entitled The Last Mile Works. This dev shop will actually employ our coding graduates as actual web developers working on private client work for outside businesses. These students will earn a market wage well above the average prison salary, while also building a resume, building a portfolio, creating marketable skills, rather than the mere $200 of gate money provided by the state. The saying is, TLM Works will build your website, you will build our future. So I have Tulio Cardozo here with me today. Uh, he is our technical, technical manager inside San Quentin State Prison, focusing completely with TLM Works engineers. He knows how frustrating it is to work in, to learn how to code inside prison because he did it himself. Graduating from our founding class of 2010 in, of the last mile, T uh, Tulio is now the first ever formerly incarcerated individual to return to San Quentin as a nonprofit program manager. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Natrina, for the, uh, the, the great introduction. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that it's both my distinct privilege and honor to be here today and to stand before you or, or sit before you as a testimony <laughs> that coding programs and that rehabilitation programs in prisons really do work. And it is an, a tremendous honor. I, I just really want to know, really want to share, to get to go back to San Quentin and be a person for the men and women that are there, uh, well, the men that are in the program, uh, that I wish that when I was trying to learn by myself in a cell, that I had a guide try to be that person for them that I wish I had, and I never had. So, statistically speaking, um, I had a higher chance of being back in prison wearing blue today 
than I am of being in this audience wearing blue. And I wore this blue suit on purpose to actually remind myself of that and as a silent celebration to remember where I came from in this. And before talking about the last miles coding program though, I think it would be useful to rewind back a little bit and to share a little bit <coughs> about my past and what exactly it was that took me to prison so that you can understand why it's so important for me to have gone back to prison. So at the beginning of November in 2003, I was literally standing in front of the largest pile of marijuana I had ever seen in my life. Immediately upon seeing that, every objection and reservation that I had about the trip that I happened to be on was completely out the window. Uh, it was enough to fill several garbage bags that could fill up uh, a couple of parking spots worth of cars. And I was in Mendocino to manufacture hash oil. Additionally, I was trying to make this happen as quick as possible because I had already been there for several weeks uh, to process this. And if, uh, if any of you know what this stuff is, it's, uh, you have to manufacture it with copious amounts of butane, a highly explosive gas, and you should be smart and do this stuff outside. <laughs> so um, again, I had never done any of this stuff prior to this, uh, to this trip, but I convinced the group of people that I was with that we should hurry up because I wanted to get home. And uh, a, a rainstorm moved into the area and I convinced them all to go inside of a motel on the side of the 101 and manufacture this stuff in there. We started that evening uh, taping up vents, electrical sockets, uh, any openings that could have sparks on the other side and uh, putting towels under the doors and wrapping wet shirts around our faces. My, if, you, if you've ever had a bad feeling in your life, like where something was wrong was gonna happen, like that was, that was the day of, <laughs> or the night of November 18th of 2003, like everything about it just had a bad vibe, but I was just too determined, too arrogant to just press on through. Um, luckily, Several hours go by after we got started. And we found ourselves at 2.30 in the morning and everything went through fine. Like all of those bad feelings just turned out to be basically like just bad feelings, just nerves. And uh, as we were putting everything away and I was focused on moving cans out of the room and whatnot, uh, my co-defendant Sam was actually worried about fumes that were still in the room. So he did the only logical thing that he could think of, which is to light a cigarette and figure it out. Instantly. I heard his voice and just looked up and glanced and saw a blue glowing ball just slowly growing across the room. And immediately my first thought in my mind was like, oh shit, <laughs> like I'm going to prison. Like this is it, you know? And uh, immediately that, 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 that ball hit me. The bomb squad, later testified in my criminal case that the temperature in the room instantly shot up to 1500 degrees. It's what's considered a flash fire. Um, and I'll tell you what, without getting too graphic into what happened to my skin, it sure felt like a flash fire. Mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't get out. Um, and in the heat of the moment, I frankly, didn't know what to do, and it was an epitome of like what got me to there in the first place. And I literally picked a spot on the floor. I looked at it, and I decided to lay down in it and to die, because I didn't know what else to do. And it was just hurting too much. I was a, I was a person who was so self-conscious that I was too afraid to take control of my life, even when I was literally about to end. And um, as I laid there on the floor, for whatever reason, I looked over and I saw the friend, I saw the bottoms of my co-defendant's feet. And he must have had like a size 16 or something because they were huge white soles, <laughs> go through a tiny little bathroom window. And immediately I stood up and I took a couple of leaps and I never even stepped foot in that bathroom. I just dove through it into, uh, 
and to safety, I guess you could say. Uh, so my instinct did, did come through there, luckily, at the end. Um, there's more to the story, but the point of it is, is that that's when I discovered that I, I didn't have what I needed, those skills, to even save my own life. Uh, being incarcerated as a result of that evening was far more difficult than dealing with the physical aftermath of that night. I received third degree burns on 47% of my body, which I mean are still evident to this day and will be until forever basically. And, um, but it was nothing compared to spending almost seven years in prison where it was a reality check, like a, a, a constant daily challenge to take control of my life that lasted those, that, 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 that period. Um, the first year, I spent just realizing that my way, frankly, wasn't the right way. Like everything that I thought was the right thing to do obviously didn't work, and that's what got me there in the first place. And I realized that I needed to be open to other people's opinions. Luckily, in San Quentin, there exists a unique culture of people that are supporting each other, of educational programs, of volunteers due to its, its really close proximity to San Francisco, its great city where lots of people are, are willing to cross, drive across the bay to us. And um, I found happiness in San Quentin for the very first time, sitting on a top rack with, a, with an empty locker and uh, you know, no money on my books. And it was because I learned lessons from people doing life that taught me things like kids take choices and adults make decisions. And I really internalized little things like that um, as a personal challenge to finally wake up. Like, I'm in prison, you know. You already almost let yourself die. Like, what are you gonna do now, right? And I literally challenged myself and decided, regardless of whether or not it was an option, that I was going to learn how to be a software developer. Because that was actually my goal before I ever got mixed up into drugs when I was a kid. I was really into computers. I wanted to go in the Air Force. But uh, marijuana and you know, the fact that I didn't know how to deal with social issues from my childhood like, made me go down that other track. So. I spent the next several years uh, working inside of San Quentin, building applications for the education department in Microsoft Access. And before I was released, an AW there uh, actually pulled me to the side. I was, I was creating a piece of software that was point-click friendly. He pulled me to the side and said, look, Tulio, I really appreciate what you're trying to do, but don't give it to the state. Like, parole, get out, start a company, be a contractor, and there you go. You, know, you, you, you have a skill that people want to hire you for. And I really like internalized that. And unfortunately, I was transferred to a different prison in, in Arizona. Uh, but while I was there for another three and a half years, uh, with no program options available, I, I spent it reading computer programming books and really, really diving deeply. So what ended up happening is, is uh, I ended up making a realization one day when it was finally time to go home. The first of the two realizations that I made is, is that when I found out I was getting released, and I had no release date, it was just an officer walked into my, my cell at nine in the morning and said, you're leaving today, so get ready to go. Um, when I found that out, I counted how many pages of, of software development books were in my room. And it was over 17,000 pages of programming books in .NET, C Sharp, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was the first realization that like, wow, I, I, I really committed to this. And the second realization that I had this is, um, I had a note tucked away in one of these programming books that said, I want to go home today, but I'm glad that I was here yesterday. <coughs> and like, I don't know when I wrote it, but definitely, like, that still held true. I was really happy to have been there all of those years because he gave me the time and the opportunity to uh, practice, right? Because I was trying to learn how to code on paper. Like, who does that? My notebook <laughs> was actually a notepad. Your notebook was a laptop. <laughs> uh, so I got out and I wrote an email to San Quentin State Prison and it's literally one of the very first emails in my Gmail account. And I said, look, I got out, everything's okay, 
and I want to come back, but not as an inmate. I want to come back in like five years or however long it takes and teach a class on web development and app development because I had the foresight when I was incarcerated to realize that nobody would probably hire me. Like Ray Hartz was mentioning in the, in, in the video, like that's how I felt. Like who's going to give me a job? I'm a cook. And even though that wasn't what I did, like that's what I got arrested for. So I got the label. That's it. And they wrote me back, ecstatic that I was released. And they said, look, that's a great idea, but before you go do all that, like, you've got to meet somebody in the last mile. If you were here, you'd be in their program. And long story short, I got an introduction to Chris Redlitz, and I accepted his invitation to participate in the program, later became a founding graduate of the program. And through Chris and Beverly's help, they pushed me out into the work field where I was able to freelance and eventually become a, the first hire at a, at a tech startup in San Francisco called Launch Podium. I was their, their very first engineer. And we built the company uh, up until it, uh, I left just shortly before it was acquired by another company. So I feel really proud of that. Uh, directly after that, I branched out on my own and I hired several formerly incarcerated people, including Eddie Griffin, who was in the video, uh, the jazz man. Mm -hmm. And I hired even one of my uh, former cellmates in Arizona who didn't have anything to do with coding, but uh, he's my project manager to this day for all of my freelance uh, web development clients that I have uh, on the side from what I do from this stuff. Um, so that brings me to today. Um, it's my distinct honor and privilege and pleasure to share with you what we're doing with The Last Mile Works because with a joint public and private uh, participation or partnership, thank you, uh, with a joint public and partner, uh, private partnership uh, with the state of California, we are actually able to create a, an environment that helps people actually be able to have hands-on experience and not only go through a class that they can learn how to code in. And again, this is people who have never even probably touched a computer, definitely never seen the internet. And we're going from that level of beginner through a year's worth of computer programming covering HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, in the second track, things like Node, uh, React, uh, a couple other things like Ajax calls using WordPress, REST, REST APIs, all the things that they would need to really work at a company. And then when they graduate that business or that company, they actually get to interview inside of San Quentin to work at a real company that does real business with the real outside world. And they get to interview to work for me and I get to be that person to them today uh, during the week uh, that I always wish I had as a mentor. Now, it's, it's really interesting for me because what the last mile has created is a cloud-based uh, infrastructure internal to replicate the internet. These guys don't have the internet. And we created an internal solution that can uh, not only provide our content but create development stacks so that they can actually code just like they had on the internet through the same tools and be ready to parole with a living wage that they created, job uh, prospects, code samples, and many other things that they would really need to prove that they can actually do it. They're not learning something that was outdated 20 years ago. So in closing, because I know I have limited time, um, I just want to say that one of our biggest things that we are trying to do is to share the stories of the, the men and the women that are going through our program. And starting last week, or actually yesterday, um, we created the Last Mile Radio, and it's a uh, program that you can hear on Sirius XM that uh, is, it, it goes over real stories of transformative change for people that are going through this program and taking those steps uh, whether they're through technology or whether they're through, through an entrepreneurship or just going through and succeeding out of prison. Um, you can catch up on it if you'd like uh, without a Sirius XM subscription through the lastmileradio.org and you can hear all the future episodes through that. Um, but I want to remind you that uh, as a testament to the, to the power of what's going on here, coding in prison changed the trajectory of my life, but what we're doing now is so much better than everything that I had that I know for a fact that these men that are going through this program will be every single one of my achievements in a significantly shorter amount of time because they actually have everything at their disposal. 
the people like, that did it like me, who, if I could do it, they could do it, but they have everything that I had, and they can do it now. They don't have to wait until they get out, and they are doing it now, and going home with, with money so that they can buy a computer and continue to work now. So, anyways. <laughs>